Hello, welcome back to Outmouse Labs. My name is Penny and I'm glad you're here. We're going to be continuing our series today on building a Pong clone in Dragon Ruby. So we actually are going to finish it. So this video is going to be a bit longer, I think, and we're going to break it up into parts. So to begin with, we're going to pick up where we left off, which would be getting our ball to bounce off our paddles, um, and then setting up a game over and win condition. Okay, so let's turn to the code. All right, so since we are last here, what we need to do is set it up so that our balls bounce off their paddles. Let's start there. So, to do that, under ball movement, right here, I've set it to check if it's reflected off the left or reflected off the right every time, 60 times per second, every frame. That, those are just functions that I've created, and I went ahead and put them above this function. I don't think that's required in Dragon Ruby, but just in case, that's what I'm used to, and in some languages it is. So we're going to go up to those uh, those functions. So reflect ball left takes in args. This says return, in other words, do nothing, unless the two rectangles of the ball and the paddle, the left paddle, are intersecting. So args.geometry.intersectRect is a function that comes with Dragon Ruby. You can check out how it works in the docs. I'll link the docs below, and you just go to the docs and uh, search for intersectRect. If they are intersecting, what we're going to do is check it, or we're going to assign the paddle center point, which is the lpaddle.y plus the lpaddle.height divided by 2, to a variable, and the acceleration of the ball to a variable the y acceleration specifically. In the x direction, so in the horizontal direction, we're simply going to reverse it. And to reverse something, you multiply by negative 1. So if the ball is going left, it'll now be going right. The y is a little bit more complicated. So what we're going to do is if the player, if the paddle center is less than half of the height of the, of the window, so in other words, if it's in the bottom half, um, and the acceleration of the ball is greater than or equal to zero, we're going to simply add two to the acceleration because um, we're going to send it back going up just a little faster. If it is still, if the paddle is still in the bottom half, but the acceleration is less than zero, in other words, if it's coming down, we're going to multiply it by negative one to turn it to up and then add the two. So the effect will be the same, but we have to check and see is it coming down or is it going up? because we want it to bounce up in that scenario. Next up is the opposite. If it's if the paddle is in the upper half and the acceleration of the ball is heading uh, down, I'm sorry, heading up, then we're going to just, say, make it a little bit faster. Only this time faster will be negative because it's heading down. Finally, if the paddle is above the top of the screen, or above the middle point of the screen, and the ball is heading up, then we're going to multiply it by negative 1, so it's headed down, and then add that 2 to make it faster. So go ahead and look at that. I know it's sort of a tough thing to understand, but it, with, in a little bit simpler terms, if the ball is coming down, we want it to bounce back up if, it's, if the paddle is lower, and we want it to bounce down if the paddle is higher. It's just to make it do what you kind of expect it to do. So that's how it works. All right, reflect ball right. It's exactly the same. The only real difference is it's going to check and see if it's on the computer paddle instead. Otherwise, it's going to do exactly the same thing. So with that, we will have our paddles and our balls connecting. And the ball will bounce off in a logical ways. I'm going to leave this for you to look at for just a second. Or you can pause your video course. OK, the next thing that we need is for the computer paddle to track the ball. Now you can do this really simply. Um, so I'm going to create a function called AI movement. And we could just say that the right paddle's Y will always be the same as the ball's Y. The problem is that makes the computer perfect. It's essentially impossible to win. So you have to create some lag. There's lots of ways you could create lag, but the way that I chose to do it was by giving the right paddle a speed. So we hit check its speed and its speed is assigned up here in the defaults section where we make our paddle at speed is 7. Our player speed is 10, so our player speed is actually a little bit faster. If you set the player speed and the computer speed to the same, typically the computer can't lose. You can also make the game more or less difficult simply by changing this speed variable. 
So what's nice about that is you could ha say have it every time the player wins, the next game it adds one, so it gets harder over time if you wanted. But I'm just going to do some, you know, keep it here static. All right. So the next thing we are going to do is I'm just changing plain to false when it starts, and I'll explain why in a little bit. Um, so the next thing we're going to do in our AI movement is we're going to look and see if the ball's Y, if the ball is higher or lower on the screen. In this case, if it is higher on the screen. If so, then we're going to have the paddle move up. If the ball is lower than the paddle, we're going to have the paddle move down at the, at the paddle speed. If the otherwise, we're just going to have the paddle sit at zero um, or not move, in other words. If the, so, this next line says if the paddle's y plus the paddle's height is greater than the size of the window, then set it to the size of the window. And then the, the next one just does if it's lower than the bottom of the window, set it to the bottom of the window. This is just so the paddle doesn't go flying off the screen up and down as it follows the ball. All right, finally, we're going to return unless the paddle is less than zero. And if it is, we're going to set it to zero. So AI movement, also not that hard. Essentially, we're having the paddle follow the ball at a certain speed, which creates the lag so the player can win. Change the speed, you change the hardness of the game. All right, so we now have our paddles connecting. We have our uh, computer AI working. Combined with everything we did last video, we should have a game. So let's check it out. And we do. So this is our game before any kind of pizzazz. But as you can see, everything works like you might expect. And like I said, at this speed, it is pretty hard. Like the computer is not an easy opponent. I'm going to go ahead and let it win. So it scores just like we had before. And then if it scores a second time, game over. And you can press R to replay. So how do we get that game over to work? That's our next piece. Well, the game over was not hard to set up either. So once again, we're going to be creating a function. And down here in tick, we have defaults args, render args, and game over args. So set up our, set up our files and our variables, draw our screen, check if there's a game over, and return unless, so do nothing unless the state of play is true. If it is true, process our input, our ball movement, and our AI movement. Make sense? Okay. So our plane is true. It's just up here at the top. And it's either, you know, I've got set to f stay whatever it is or to false. And we need a way to know when we've gotten a game over. So we run our game over script. So it returns. It does nothing unless the computer score or the player score is set to the winning number. The winning number is up here at the top. If you change this 2 to 5 or 10, that's how many it takes. I'm using 2 for testing purposes. I would recommend 5 for the actual game. Okay, so assuming that it, one of the players hits the target number, it sets playing to false, which means that we stop having the input, we stop having movement. If the p computer hits the winning number, it's going to say game over and press R to play again. If the computer or if the player hits the winning score, it's going to say congratulations and then play again. It's going to wait until you hit R. So return unless the input.keyboard.keydown is R, at which point we're going to run args.gdk.resetNextTick, meaning so args.gdk is the game toolkit. It's part of Dragon Ruby and reset next tick resets on the next frame. It's very similar to this piece down at the bottom that we're using so that it resets every time we save. Only it waits a tick and it only happens when you hit R during the game over screen. All right, hopefully that all made sense. I'm going to let you take a look here for a second. And because we have it checking game over every turn, as soon as somebody wins, it's going to flip over into game over. All right, hopefully that all made sense. Let's see believe that is all what we need. I'm going to do one thing real quick, and this is a part of the debugging process. I'm going to type in the word winning and make sure that it's only 
where it's you know only doing things when it's supposed to. So yes, yes, yes. Okay, yeah. So we're gonna save. And in a moment it's gonna finish saving. This is the linter that takes it a second. There we go. And oops, hit the wrong thing. We're going to load up Dragon Ruby. And there we go. Because we have it set to false, it's not plain. We can't move, we can't do anything. When we set it to so when we set plain to true, however. Now, when we run our game, it comes to life. All right, so that's it for the basics. Now we're going to move into adding some extra features. The game is technically done now. Everything runs. All right, so extra features. We are going to add some images and some sounds. So I've already made the code. I'm going to copy it over and then show you where it's different. And there really is very few differences. So. Difference number one is how we make our paddles and our ball. We've gotten rid of the RGB in their hashes and we've added path. And the path goes to the place where you put images. You put images in sprites. So it's sprites, left paddle.png, sprites, right paddle.png, and sprites, comp ball.png. All right, so now we've added the image paths and gotten rid of their solid rectangles which means down in render which is way down here there we go we take the paddles and the ball out of output solids and we put them in output sprites output sprites does the same thing only it shows pictures instead of solid rectangles just as a reminder in case Solids is just an array with state.bg, state.center bar. Sprites is state.l paddle, r paddle, and state ball. All three of those used to be up here. Sprites needs to be under solids when you render because whatever is under will be rendered on top. And we want our sprites to be on top of our solids like the, uh, like the background. And we also want the ball to be on top of the paddles it shouldn't matter because it should bounce off but just in case we're going to go ahead and do that one last extra uh, additional step i put in just because i think it looks nice up in my two reflects so reflecting the ball left and reflecting the ball right i added args.state.ball.path equals player ball or comp ball so the ball actually has two different sprites when it hits one of the paddles it's going to change to that paddle's color which i think just adds a little bit of visual juice. Let's take a look. So we changed less than 10 lines of code and this is what we get. The important piece here to notice is that it looks, I mean, significantly different. We only changed 10 lines of code because really getting the game working is the hardest part. Adding graphics, sounds, that sort of thing, it's difficult to make those things sometimes but it's not difficult to change from placeholders into them usually, especially not in Dragon Ruby. So what that means is focus on getting your game working uh, and focus on getting your game doing what you want it to do, being performant, and then add the graphics in at the end. You don't need to wait on your graphic artists or get lost making graphics while you're making your game, especially if it's a small one like this. Now that said, making art or music can be a ton of fun. And if you're finding yourself feeling a little burnt out on coding, Go for it. Take a break and work on some art. So different ways to do different things. Here you are seeing that the game is pretty tough at this uh, difficulty level. You can win, but the computer is not going to give in easily. <laughs> so, all right. So last but not least, let's add in sounds. Again, I have the code ready. And again, it's really only changing a few lines. So what have we done? Well, down in tick we have started our background music. So start music at the beginning of game. That's a comment. You can tell because it's in green and has the pound sign. So if args.state.tick equals zero, in other words, if it's the first frame of the game, create a piece of music called BG music. 
Um, this is called a symbol, technically, you can tell because of the colon. But just think of it as another container or special variable, really. And this symbol has a, is assigned to a hash. The hash has an input, which is in our sound folder. So we can look at our sounds. There they are. And it plays summerbeach.org at 40% volume, and it loops. Summerbeach.org is something I made in 1-Bit Dragon. It's a wonderful program for making your own chiptune music, among other things. And you are welcome to use that file however you'd like. Uh, please credit uh, Outmouse in your attribution. Thank you. Or Outmouse Labs. All right. So the next thing we do, so that's one thing we've added. Then we add, under Reflect Ball Right, the same thing. We're going to call this one Bump. Sounds Bump. Full volume. Looping false. Exactly the same in our Reflect Ball Left. So it's going to make a bumping sound when the ball hits the paddle. When the computer scores, it's going to play the comp score sound, which is the same as the bumps. It's looping false, full volume. And when the player scores, it's going to play player score. Same as before. All right, so that's four hashes, two lines of code, nothing big. And we're going to hit save. And run our game. And we have sound. The bumps are a little bit hard to hear, but hopefully you can hear them. Oh, <laughs> one second. I actually don't have the sound on, so that's not going to do much good for you. One moment. Okay. So hopefully you'll be able to hear that in just a moment. Let's try that again. Okay, there we go. Now you can hear it. So... You hear the bump as it hits the paddles. You can hear the music. And if the computer scores, well, maybe. Let's see if I can actually score. Oh, there's the computer score. And I'll see if I can score in a minute or so. If I can't, I won't belabor the point. But it's a slightly different sound. And adding sound is a quick way to add a lot of interest in your game and a lot of extra you know, extra experience for your players. So I highly recommend adding uh, sound whenever possible. And there you have it. You have a complete Pong clone that is customizable with difficulty with a single number, customizable with wind condition with a single number. You can change out the music simply by changing what file it points to. I hope that you are able to use this and I hope that you learned something. Please consider liking and subscribing if you enjoy this content. Let me know what kind of game you might like me to do in Dragon Ruby next. I'm thinking of doing a visual novel. Um, again, just like these, it'll be very simple just showing how you might do it. Let me know if that's interesting or if you'd rather something else. Um, I think that's everything. Thank you and have fun out there, Dragon Riders.